Good afternoon and welcome to URI's 11th Annual Spring Humanities Festival. I'm Eve Stern, Director of the Center for the Humanities, and I'm delighted to see so many people here with us today. And I know we have hundreds of people watching the live stream from their homes and offices. So it's really wonderful to have such a great reception to this event. This afternoon's event, as many of you know, is the culmination of our year-long lecture series Re-Envisioning Nature, an Environmental Humanities Lecture Series, coordinated by the Center for the Humanities. This year-long series has brought historians, literary scholars, writers, and musicians together to URI to help us think about how the humanities can help us to engage with the pressing environmental questions of the day. The series has accomplished just what we hoped it would do, bringing together students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community members across disciplinary lines to discuss issues that affect us all deeply. And the center is very grateful to departments across campus that have generously supported this series. And especially today, I'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences and the provost's office for hosting today's event. Please join me in welcoming Provost Barbara Wolf, who will offer a few remarks. Good afternoon. What a gorgeous day this is. Every day in Rhode Island should be like this, right? We just went, opened with spring, and we are already in summer, so who knew? Anyway, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, Particularly, every year, the URI Humanities community gathers together in April to celebrate the accomplishments of our students and faculty in the humanities and to really reflect upon the importance of humanities in helping us to understand the past, the present, and to look into the future and how we can influence our future together. This year's Environmental Humanities Series has demonstrated the important role of disciplines like history, English, philosophy, and creative writing, and that they can play an important role in engaging with the environmental questions and dilemmas that actually consume all of us today. It is critical not only to do the hard science and to create the policy, but also to ask the humanistic questions about how people perceive, understand, and interact with our environment. We need to get humanists, earth scientists, and social scientists in the room together. And this year's Humanities Series has accomplished just that. I look forward to much more dialogue as, you and our, as URI embarks on its commitment to nurturing the blue economy and the role that disciplines across the university, including the humanities, can contribute to that dialogue. I just want to say how thrilled we are to have Elizabeth Colbert join us here on our Kingston campus. And as an undergraduate English major who went on to become one of the nation's most celebrated scientific writers, she has demonstrated through her career the way that humanities and sciences can come together to engage with the pressing issues today. You will hear more about her from Professor Sevilla, who will introduce her later in the program this afternoon. At this time, I would like to invite up to the podium and to introduce to you Dean Jen Riley of the College of Arts and Sciences to present this year's Humanities Students Excellence Award. Good afternoon. Um, at the risk of throwing Eve's schedule off just a little bit, I'm going to take the Dean's prerogative for a moment because I want to note this moment for us, because this has been a really fantastic year for the series. URI's new strategic plan, Focus URI, makes a direct call to the university to continue and to grow its impact on the blue economy for the state of Rhode Island. And URI is a key player in the blue economy in our state via research that happens across the campus. There's also URI's partnership with industry. You probably saw a few of these in the news recently. The university's collaboration with the first US offshore wind farm near Block Island on our focus on renewable energy. You probably saw the news story this week in our partnership with Perry Raso, a University of Rhode Island graduate who found a Matunic oyster farm, oyster bar vegetable farm, and is now working with us and the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association to launch the Matunic Shellfish Hatchery and Research Center. 
What I want to highlight today in addition to that is the way the humanities at URI are also playing a role in our work on the blue economy. The Center for the Humanities with the Re-Envisioning Nature and Environmental Humanities Lecture Series has provided a significant experience asking us to rethink how we interact with the environment and to consider how the humanities can guide us in delving into the values, ethics, and responsibilities we have as individuals and as communities to address the environmental challenges we are facing. As the director for the Center of Humanities, Professor Eve Stern has said, the goal of the series was and is to determine how the humanities help us to engage with the urgent environmental questions of our day. The series has done just that, and many of you, I think, probably experienced that this year. We had Rob Nixon from Princeton revisiting his book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, where he discussed slow violence in relation to some of the most urgent issues of our time, such as climate breakdown and the future of fracking. We had the experience of hearing from Rosalind Lapeer from the University of Illinois, one of eight indigenous professors nationally in an environmental studies sciences sustainability department, who shared with the audience that while many people think that bison and men hunting bison were central to the story of the indigenous peoples on the Northern Great Plains, it was really women and the planting that sustained them. Terry Tempest Williams joined us to share her most recent writings on the fires that have consumed the West in recent years, as well as discuss how environmental issues are social issues and why public lands matter for all of us. The artist Jake Blunt joined us for the talk Go in the Wilderness, Black Spirituals and the Natural Environment, and also gave a concert featuring music from his new album, New Faith. And today we're here to join in conversation with Elizabeth Colbert, who has built a reputation as one of the nation's most prominent voices on climate change. This conversation was prefaced by a big read of Colbert's Under a White Sky with 100 copies of the book snatched up quickly, followed by discussions led by URI labor and environmental historian Eric Loomis and URI environmental historian Jimena Sabia. This is the humanities in action at URI, helping us to understand who we are, what we value, how we engage with not just each other, but how we engage with the natural environment that is central to our survival as a species. I want to extend my sincere appreciation and thanks to Director Stern, whose leadership um, has led the center to become more public facing with these wonderful series in the last three years. And I also want to recognize publicly her board, the faculty who put the energy and time into assisting with these projects. Kathleen McIntyre from Gender and Women's Studies, Marta Elena Rojas from English, Vilda Aslid from Music, Leslie Keyholfer Kemp from French and Film, Zara Magani from Philosophy, Scott Kushner from Communication Studies, Julia Lovett, our Digital Initiatives Librarian, and Karen Markin from Research Development. They deserve thanks and a good round of applause for their work. I have the pleasure every year, this is one of the, the best times of years for a dean, because you get to celebrate our students. And I get to announce our Humanities Students Excellence Awards, recognizing students who've already made substantial contributions to the humanities, both on and off campus, and show great promise in humanities careers. I'd like to ask the students and their faculty sponsors to come up and pose for a photo one by one as I briefly announce their awards, and I encourage the audience to read more about these students and their accomplishments in the program. The first undergraduate award goes to sophomore Kyle Gunning, a talented writer and musician who's majoring in English literature. Kyle, who's already won awards for his poetry and fiction, is involved in numerous activities ranging from the undergraduate literary magazine to the campus radio station. Please join me in congratulating Kyle and his faculty sponsor, Professor Travis Williams. The second undergraduate award goes to Jonah Major, a senior who's double majoring in film media and Japanese. The recipient of multiple scholarships, Jonah has enriched the URI community through his innovative films and by hosting monthly film screenings for the Japanese department. Congratulations go to Jonah and his faculty sponsors, Professors Cheryl Foster, Keith Brown, and Irie June.
for the Graduate Student Awards. Jerry Devant, who defended his dissertation in English this morning, is the winner of a Graduate Excellence Award. Jerry is a prize-winning poet who has published his work in some of the nation's most prestigious literary journals, and his first book of poetry will be published this fall. Please join me in congratulating him and his faculty sponsor, Professor Peter Covino. Our final award goes to Cherie Rowe, a doctoral student in English, as well as an accomplished actor and director. Cherie has made substantial contributions to the arts and humanities at URI and across the state as a teacher, director, and organizer of literary and theatrical events. Many congratulations to Cherie and her faculty sponsor, Professor Carolyn Batinsky. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Jimena Sevilla, an assistant professor of environmental history, who will introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Elizabeth Colbert. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning science writer and journalist. She has engaged with issues regarding global warming and many other subjects as a writer for The New Yorker. Her book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, depicts the fragility of the planet while unveiling the Anthropocene era. She does it in a way that you will want to keep reading as she showcases the many experiences of people's work around the world to preserve and save nature. I want to be brief because we're all here to see her, but I want to mention that her books have been widely recognized and have gotten a long list of prestigious awards and prizes. To mention a few, her book, The Sixth Extinction, got the 2015 Pulitzer Prize in the general nonfiction category. It was also a New York Times 2014 top 10 best book of the year, a number one on the Guardian's list of the 100 best nonfiction books of all time. Thank you all for being here. This is a conversation that will be moderated by Professor Eric Loomis, an environmental historian and a professor here in the history department at URI. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Colbert. All right, well, uh, th thanks everybody for being here. Um, and uh, it's a real honor to, uh, uh, to, in to interview Elizabeth and bring her on campus. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. I, I don't know how many of you have read uh, Under a White Sky, presumably a lot of you, but uh, no doubt not all of you. Um, and so would you start by describing the book and, and what led you to write it? Wow, that's an omen or something. Um, uh, so the book, um, kind of, you know, the way journalists work is, you know, you write one story or, or one book and that kind of leads you to the other. So what, what happened, what brought me to this book is I, I wrote a book called The Sixth Extinction, which was, you know, very downbeat, as you can imagine from the title. Um, and I was like, okay, well, what, what are we going to do? You know, we're all, we're all still here, you know, uh, for the time being at least. Uh, what are, how are we going to respond to you know, this information and what's going on. And, and that led me to the story that's sort of at the middle of Under a White Sky, which is the story of people um, trying to breed uh, corals that are tough enough to withstand global warming, uh, warmer oceans, because corals, um, as I'm sure uh, most people at, you know, marine-centric URI know, really don't like spikes in water temperature. Um, and that story, was 
such an interesting idea, really. You know, okay, now we change nature one way, now we're going to change it again to sort of uh, withstand what we are doing to it. Um, and I started to, to see that as a, as a pattern. I started to see other stories in which that was the same pattern that we had you know, messed things up one way, but now we were going to try to re-engineer the world uh, again so that uh, the impacts for ourselves or, or potentially for other creatures uh, would be less. And, and that's sort of the genesis of the book. I pursued those stories. So... One of the main uh, subjects of, of the book is uh, sort of geoengineering and these desperate attempts to save climate or to save, save nature from climate change. But, you know, I think that one of the real insights of the book is that this is hardly something new, right? I mean, you, ta you start by talking about the Chicago River and how a very early form of geoengineering, which long before that term was known, has drastically transformed the ecosystem of the Midwest. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so uh, another story that sort of prompted this was a story that anyone um, prompted this book is a story that anyone who grew up in the Midwest probably knows, or certainly anyone who grew up in Chicago, is the story of the reversal of the Chicago River, which is, those of you who read the book know, the, the first story in the book, and that also really intrigued me. I am not, you know, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker by birth, and I had never heard about it until about a decade ago. I was like, that's amazing. And as Eric points out, that happened all the way back in the year 1900, the Chicago River. Um, Chicago was dumping its sewage into the Chicago River, which runs right through central Chicago and right into Lake Michigan. And it was drinking from Lake Michigan. And it's still drinking from Lake Michigan. And uh, you can all see that that's a problem. They finally realized that that, that was a problem. There was a lot of waterborne disease. Uh, they had to do something. Well, they weren't going to stop dumping their sewage, so they were going to have to re-engineer the river. And that's what they did. And it was an epic project. It took seven years. Um, was the, considered the biggest construction project. This is in the days before the Panama Canal, uh, building this huge canal that reversed the river. And that worked because, as you all know, Chicago is so flat uh, that you know, there's not much pitch to that river. Yeah, and then, you know, and not that we're going to go chapter by chapter through the book, but, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, the, the second chapter does build on this in a really useful way because, you know, kind of earlier attempts to control the Mississippi River and control Louisiana for the oil industry and against flooding have had these enormous reverberations that are only being exacerbated through climate change, and it kind of brings you to these desperate attempts to save these to save these incredibly vulnerable places. Yeah, I mean, so then we go to the the you know, so we start at one you know end of the of the Mississippi, and 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 what I should say the um, you know the impact of reversing the Chicago River, you know, what really interested me was that that then became a conduit for invasive species. I know we have some invasive species people in the audience, um, so now anything can move between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi Basin. It is on the move. Um, and that's become a huge problem. Um, and those two basins used to be inaccessible to each other except in a big flood. Um, and then we move to the bottom of the Mississippi River where land is disappearing you know, very, very fast owing to uh, a lot of factors, one simply being that New Orleans was built in a very, very vulnerable position. I mean, when the French you know, decided to settle New Orleans in 1718, uh, it was immediately a disaster. They immediately got flooded out. It's a very, very vulnerable place to build a city, and we've spent the last 300 years basically trying to protect uh, New Orleans. That's getting harder and harder, both because what we're doing to protect New Orleans, pumping out all the water uh, when it rains, is compacting the soil further, so the city is sinking at an alarming rate, um, plus sea level rise. And when you add those things together, you have a huge problem. Uh, and you have to have some very creative minds <laughs> uh, to try to figure that out. Um, and the latest you know, plan, which is, as we discussed in Eric's class this morning, going forward, uh, is to build these you know, sort of fake uh, crevasses in the, in the levee system to let the sediment that flows down the Mississippi out uh, in times of high water flow and try to rebuild some of the land around, uh, around New Orleans. And whether that can possibly be done faster than sea levels are going to rise is, is a big question. 
And, and this sort of desperate attempt to save Southern Louisiana, um, you know, then resonates through the book with all of these other, you know, much of the book is these, you know, your profiles of these attempts to just sort of throw everything at the wall and hope something sticks. <laughs> and, you know, again, could you sort of talk about one or two of those of those efforts and sort of your take on this broader attempt, you know, where we're at in 2023, knowing what's coming or at least having a sense of what's coming and not really dealing with it as a society and so moving toward ever increasingly desperate measures. Well, I, I think, you know, what, what the book is trying, to, is trying to get at is the way in which we seem to, despite being warned and warned again, um, you know, you know, uh, continue on our merry way, you know, and that's certainly the story of climate change. You know, we've been warned, um, but it's a story really in in multiple um, aspects of life. We know that you know, moving all the cargo around the world the way we do, very very indiscriminately, um, is having you know huge repercussions. Uh, once again, just you know, I think the estimate is something like. 10,000 species are being moved around in ballast water, you know, every single day uh, on our super tanker so that we are introducing, we're just completely reshuffling the biosphere and that's having huge repercussions, you know, here in New England where all our ash trees are dying, for example, just one of many examples I could cite. Um, so we just continue on our way and then when we reach a crisis point, we're like, okay, what are we going to do about this now? Uh, we can't go back, you know, we find it, or at least we find it very politically incredibly challenging uh, and for all sorts of reasons that we can also talk about. I mean, it's, it's very challenging to remake the global economy. That is very, very challenging. Um, so we're like, how can we deal with this? And one of the stories that, um, you know, I find really, I found most fascinating to report in the book uh, was about uh, trying to genetically modify uh, the cane toad, which was brought to Australia uh, back in the 1930s, has exploded, uh, is everywhere, um, is very toxic, has had huge ecological repercussions. You can't get rid of this thing. There are literally hundreds of millions of them. So now the idea is could you genetically engineer it to be less toxic? And that was just a phenomenal idea. You know, even to have that idea is kind of Sounds crazy, but you know it's so crazy it just might work. <laughs> um, and then you can go the next step, which is you know also looming out there, and 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 it's a sign of how clever we are and what we're willing, how far we're willing to go in this project. Is you can do gene drive. You can actually take a trait, um, you know, that normally would be inherited only say 50% of the time, and push it out a, a, virtually 100% of the time. And we already have you know, mosquitoes who have been in, uh, engineered this way sitting in cages right now, but maybe one day released into the uh, world to try to fight malaria. So we have these amazing technologies that uh, that's why we're in the you know, mess we're in. Um, and the question of whether another application of technology can get us out of the mess we're in is, is the big question, or a big question, because we don't seem able to muster the political will to do uh, what we know needs to be done on a, on a social, on-the-ground level. So we just keep sort of plunging ahead, hoping that the next technology will save us from ourselves. Yeah, to build on that, I mean, I, I think that one of my critiques of the United States, but really probably the, the capitalist world, is, you know, really a technological fetish. Right, that going going back to you know at the very least Thomas Edison, but probably well before that, a sort of American belief that technology will save us, that there's only positive in technology, and of course the environmental history demonstrates over and over again where they're talking about DDT, or we're talking about thalidomide, or we're talking about you know uh, Agent Orange, or talking about any number of things that it's not really like that. You know that technology is. I mean, think about the entire STEM term as if technology is inherently good. Like, what if it's not, right? I mean, what if it's bad to be developing new technologies? And so I, I'm wondering, like, you know, 
if, if some of the, the issue is our entire mindset around technology, that we don't take this seriously in terms of climate change and extinction and other biological and ecological crises, because we simply believe that someone's going to come along and invent the thing that's going to save us. Well, I think that, that it, that's definitely, you know, at the heart of the book in a lot of ways, that faith that is maybe peculiarly American. I'm not sure. I'm so much an American that I, I don't know, you know, how the rest of the world exactly feels. Probably it is, probably we are the, you know, most rah-rah. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to say, I have to say, you know, in the interest of honesty, and we talked about this um, this morning in your class a bit, you know, technology has saved us, right? I mean, you know, we were going to all starve to death, and then we got the Green Revolution, which, you know, was a big deal. I mean, many of us are alive today, billions of people are alive today because um, of, you know, what now, we would now consider to be relatively primitive technology, but which were real technological breakthroughs at their time, of their time in plant breeding, uh, and in you know flooding the world uh, with uh, synthetic fertilizers, um, and you know now we can see you know if you take that as an example, we flooded the world with nitrogen. Um, that is going to have huge repercussions, dead zones in the oceans, um, and uh, you know what are we going to do about that? A lot of people probably here at URI thinking about you know what are we going to do about that? But we're not getting rid of synthetic fertilizers because we can't. We simply cannot feed the world without nitrogen fertilizer. So this compels us in a way. I mean, one technology begets another in a, in a pretty profound way. And I think that you know we often have these. I don't even want to call them arguments because the two sides never meet. But we have strains in America right now, you know, that are very, which I am emotionally and um, intellectually in many ways attracted to. They are sort of a romantic, there's a romantic strain, you know, we're going to go back, we're going to have small farms, we're going to have, you know, organic farming, um, we're going to live very differently. I completely, you know, subscribe to that in many ways. But I will also say I don't think it's realistic. I don't think we're feeding the world on small farms these days. It's just not happening. Um, and then you have the you know, techno-optimist, well, we're going to do, you know, we're just going to massively farm, intensively, intensively farm um, the land that we have in order to try to protect the few places that are now not being farmed. You know, and these are two um, different schools of thought and my concern is that neither of them are going to work. Well, thank you for that. Um, you, you know, well, I agree. I mean, I'm pretty much in the same boat. So, yes. Um, I mean, would you talk about, I, I, we talked a little bit about this in class, but, you know, there's a sense certainly when you have conversations with a lot of people, particularly, I think, students who aren't, don't have fully necessarily fully articulated political positions, right? That there's certain issues that simply should be above politics, right? That we shouldn't be arguing over kids getting shot with guns in schools because why would that be a political issue? But of course it is, right? And I think climate is very much that too, right? People, people believe rightfully that this should be above politics. And of course, in the 1950s and 1960s, these were bipartisan issues. Much of our core environmental legislation was introduced and sponsored in Congress by congressional Republicans. Um, and now it's very much not that. So, you know, could you address the, a little bit more about the, the political world and in, in the people that you talk to, since you have access to people that most of us don't, how are people in power kind of approaching the political polarization issue when it comes to this impending doom? <laughs> well, they're not handling it that well. Um, you know, I, I, I do want to say that I, I, I started my career as a political reporter, and um, when I first started, you know, covering climate change back in the early 2000s, one of my, you know, sources, someone I spoke to fairly regularly, was Don McCain, who was his big sponsor of, you know, the first cap and trade bill, really. Um, and he said to me, and I, I, I quoted him in, a, in a, my first book, you know, 
uh, it's unclear whether our political system can deal with this problem. <laughs> and that has really been borne out. Now, did he already see, you know, sort of where the Republican Party was, was going? Probably, you know, he was very, and, and he himself, you know, um, really betrayed the cause, to be frank. I mean, he really, you know, when he nom took Sarah Palin, as I mean, you all know this story. Um, so he felt the pressure, obviously. He, he was pretty well versed in the science, and he knew what exactly was going on, but, but he couldn't withstand the political pressure. So um, I think that, you know, the incredible thing is that you have a lot of, you know, Western states, let's take Utah, you know, which has been in a huge drought, got a lot of snow this winter. You know, I, I understand Terry Tempest Williams is coming back to, um, to the commencement, and she wrote a, a great article, which I'm sure many of you read, about the death of the Great Salt Lake. You know, really, there is a problem, there's a concern that the Great Salt Lake will simply dry up. Um, and they can't deal with it. You know, they, they can't face the, um, you have people still saying, well, you know, this is just, you know, a cycle. We're going to go through a new cycle, you know, and then they get a lot of snow and that convinces people that, you know, maybe they were right. You know, maybe God is really on our side after all. Um, and so the, even when you have, you know, direct threats to people's livelihoods and lives, it's very hard to get them to, it turns out to be surprisingly hard. And we saw this with COVID, you know, it was a deadly disease <laughs> that you could catch uh, and it could kill you, but people managed to maintain certain belief systems, you know, up until, you know, they were in the, they were hospitalized. And um, I don't know how we're going to break out of that, um, of this divide right now. I, th I think people's views are so entrenched. Many people, probably there are people in the audience today who are working on the social science aspect of that but no one has come up with, you know, the solution, obviously, because here we are. So to, to think about this more positively, <laughs> um, you know, in this room, there is a lot of highly educated people, um, a lot of people who are getting their educations and are going out in the world and are probably going to do some pretty amazing things. W what are some things that you've seen over the, the years that, you know, can help us to go out into the world and instead of going home and just like, I don't know, weeping, um, that we can, we can say, hey, you know, let's move forward. Let's do some really positive things here. You know, all is not lost. Because I think that if one thing is certainly true is that despair is the worst possible answer to this because then we just give up and that's, that's hopeless. Well, I, I, I mean, I do think there are a lot of positive things going on. And, you know, one, I mean, th the best news, and once again, this isn't an original point at all, um, in the climate sphere recently is the really, really dramatic drop in the cost of solar, uh, in the cost of wind, both of which, you know, didn't happen coincidentally. They happened um, because there was a lot of political will and effort and money put into it, not here in the US, I might add, but in other parts of the world. Um, and we are reaping the benefits of that, LEDs also. Um, so, you know, you know, I am neither, you know, pro-tech nor anti-tech, as many people point out, um, you know, when we look for solutions to climate change, and I use the word solutions very loosely, we are always looking to new technology, right? We never say, oh, we're just gonna stop using energy. You know, we're gonna go back to, you know, burning cow dung. You know, we never really uh, say that because it's not really very practical when you have eight billion people on the planet. Um, so we are always looking to new technologies. Solar is a phenomenal technology, relatively recent technology, and is, you know, has, has largely, owing to the Chinese, has come down radically in price. Um, so there are a lot of, there is a lot of positive news on the clean energy uh, front, and there are, you know, more and more people, there's more and more venture capital, there's more and more government money, you know, the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is going to drive a lot of money into a lot of new um, spheres. Some of them will fail miserably, but some of them may succeed spectacularly. And so I think, you know, that is the good news, and we do have to hope, all of us, 
that there are technologies out there that even we haven't even necessarily thought of yet uh, that are going to prove uh, spectacularly useful. And you know, I uh, once wrote a piece about you know, about Florida, which is a very difficult problem. They're built on limestone. You know, the water is seeping in underneath. It's going to be very difficult to protect Florida from sea level rise. And I remember the mayor of um, Miami Beach held up his iPhone and he said, you know, 30 years ago, uh, if I had told you about this thing, you would not have believed me. And, you know, 30 years from now, maybe there will be something to save Miami Beach. Now, I would not be putting my money into Miami Beach at this point, but maybe he is right. I mean, one of the, you know, thinking about this time frame thing, I mean, one of the issues I think around dealing with climate change is that it doesn't happen immediately, right? And, you know, I look at my, my dad, for instance, uh, who's 80 and uh, um, is probably the only, like, old, like, rural, western, white Reagan voter from Idaho who ended up, like, moving way to the left. And I had nothing to do with it. I want to be clear. Like, nothing to do with it. It was really weird. But in any case, like, he now can see, you know, he was all back in the 90s, blah, blah, environmentalist, blah, blah. But now he sees it, right? He sees it over now his lifetime because it's much hotter, it's much drier. There's the fires in Oregon, you know, fires across the West. These beloved landscapes are, we're losing them. And over that period of time, he can now see it. But, but unlike, say, pollution you know, or a smokestack, there's no physical manifestation that's if we shut that down, everything's good. And so you know, I'm wondering about the, the limitations of the human lifespan in sort of comprehending this. Because I think that one thing that's all really important to understand is that whatever you, I think this is true, whatever era you grow up in, you think that's normal. Even if it's very not normal, you think it's normal because, of course, you do. Well, I think that that is, I mean, the good news <laughs> is it's not, nothing's going to stay the same, right? Even, you know, the climate of today is not the climate of next year, is not the climate of the year after. So everyone will get to see, you know, the climate in action. Um, so on some level, I don't worry about that so much. But definitely, you know, the shifting baseline, you know, phenomenon, um, is is super real, and I'm sure that people who grew up here, you know, going to the beach and seeing the, you know, what was in this in in the water um, and the bird life and whatever whatever it is. I don't know. I'm not an expert on you know um, the ecology of um, of Rhode Island would see very dramatic changes over the course of the last 50 years. S some positive too, as we discussed. You know, the return of eagles um, who are not here. I, I hope they're here. <laughs> um, they are in Western Mass. Um, you know, so some positive changes and a lot of a lot of loss. Um, so I think that that and you know, you you mentioned um, earlier this morning, you know, that there's now a smoke season out west, you know, and that everyone now just anticipates that that's the new normal. You know, people do get used to anything basically. Um, so yes, I think that that is that that is a big problem. But I would like to know the secret of your father's conversion because maybe that's the secret to all of our problems. Maybe that's. A no, the, the real secret is that my mom had serious health issues, and when, when I and my brother left home, they became, they, like, my mom was so mother-oriented that they started bringing in um, foreign exchange students from Europe, and they very quickly realized that they needed to bring working-class kids because it was a small house and working-class family, and lo and behold, like, you know, so you, this kid from the Netherlands or whatever comes to uh, my parents' house for a year, and, like, the dad and mom come over at the end of the year and they take like a three week vacation to the US and they talk about the great health care. And my dad's like, wait a minute, why don't I have those things? So it's actually, it was actually like, it was often his exposure to other people, you know, certainly not exposure to me. So, yeah, no. um, well, uh, just I think two more questions and then we'll, we'll open it up to the uh, audience. I mean, the first is, um, you know, we are at the point now where we've had a pretty active environmental movement for over a half a century. And there's been a lot of wins, um, and there's been some losses, um, and there's been a lot of strategic shifts um, in environmentalism. And I'm wondering if, in terms of these both short and longer term struggles around these issues, if you think that the, if there's things that we can learn from the successes and failures of the environmental movement in, in handling the problems of the last 50 years. Well, if, a small yeah. question, I know. Yeah, that's that's yeah, small question. Um, I mean, I think that 
you know, and once again, this is not an original point at all. You're, you're, the, you sort of alluded to it, right? That the that the problems of the of the '60s and '70s were things that people could see. You know, the Santa Barbara oil spill. You know, the Cayuga River on fire. You know, they were very you know smog in L.A. They were very very visible, and people people could see them. Whereas um, CO two has the you know nasty um, quality of of being just you know completely invisible. And I I once interviewed a guy. Um, uh, yeah, he's actually he's actually in Under a White Sky. Who said, you know, we should basically he would hand people a bag of sand. It's like, what what um, kind of car do you drive? Okay, you know, a gallon. When you drive 50 miles, this is how much CO2 you're you're producing, and hand you a bag of sand with that weight, and it's quite a lot. You know, one one gallon of gas uh, produces like 22 pounds of CO2. So you have to if you had to lug that that sand around, you know, maybe you'd, maybe you get the picture. But you know, it's hard to get people to do that. Um, but it's an interesting you know mental exercise. So with the problem that's both invisible and also in which you know we are all implicated and everything we do is implicated, um, it's very the politics around that are are extremely um, complicated. But I think that the only answer, you know, and we did see some some glimmer of hope last summer. We did get a bill, you know, however flawed it might be. Finally, addressing you know some aspects of climate change, doing something at least, um, is is coalition building. What else can you do? You have to do that, and maybe there will be as you know farming gets more difficult. Everything is going to get more difficult. Um, maybe there will are coalitions you know waiting to be born. The last question I would have, and, and actually before I ask it, I realize my dad's probably watching this, so hopefully he's not mad at me at the end of this, but, um, uh, but the last question that I, that I have has to do with environmental humanities. Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of your reporting, of course, is talking about um, you know, engineers and, and scientists, and we all know that we need a lot of quality engineering, a lot of quality science um, out there, and I think that probably most humanities uh, faculty and, and, and like support that, right? Um, but there's no question that the humanities have been heavily devalued within the university, attacks from state legislatures, defunding, not getting positions, all this sort of thing. And so, you know, if we're in a kind of an all hands on deck moment, you know, why is the environmental humanities necessary in be playing our role for people whose brains work differently and don't know math and look at a a robot and it's like, I don't know what's going on here. All of these different kinds of brains, what can we offer? Why are we necessary in this struggle against climate change, extinction, and all these other environmental catastrophes? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm definitely, you know, myself, a product um, of, a, of a humanistic education. Um, and so I'm probably, um, biased <laughs> as that. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the, one of the main problems with scientists, I, I see this all the time because I interview them a lot, is, you know, they're, they are often terrible communicators and they um, speak in this kind of jargon, you know, that no person can understand. And I read a lot of this, I read a lot of scientific literature and often I can't understand it. You know, my math skills aren't good enough and, uh, and I just can't uh, get, really understand it even though you know I can I can you know quote unquote read it so I think that the um, I see my own role and this is not environmental humanities per se but I, I see my own role often as translating information you know the, that is widely available in the scientific literature to the broader public who's not reading the scientific literature and I think you know if you go back to this sort of you know, two worlds of C.P. Snow, we, we still live in those two worlds. Um, one world has, has, you know, maybe risen while the other has fallen uh, in, in, you know, being valued by society. But really, most people live. Where most people live is not in the STEM world. And where most people's minds are is not in the STEM world. And so somehow, you know, bridging that, somehow making uh, what's going on a uh, both vivid and and thinking through the many issues. I mean, you know, you know, now we're confronting so many issues of technology, as you say, good or bad. I mean, we're 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 you know going to be confronted with 
you know, AI is going to sweep through, I think, in ways that we can only begin to think about, you know, is good or bad. Um, obviously, there's a huge role for people to play, but it, it, it's often very, very difficult, you know, to, to uh, get society to, you know, stop and think about what are we really doing here. And I guess that is the, I see as the role for the environmental humanities. Uh, can you get people to stop and think, do, is this really what we want to be doing? Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So we have time for questions, and I'll bring the microphone around. Yes, I'd like to uh, cut to the chase. Uh, given everything you said this afternoon, are you essentially optimistic or pessimistic about our chances? <laughs> you know, it, it depends what you mean about our chances. Um, you know, I'm... I'm quite pessimistic that we're going to avoid, you know, unbelievable damage. We're already seeing it. It's, it's in motion. Um, damage that will be very damaging to human beings. It will be very, very damaging to other species. I don't think there's any question about that. Long term. Long term, you know, um, in the, as, what was the famous, uh, you know, long, um, in the long run, how long are we talking? 50 years? Yeah, 50 years. Um, life's going to be harder, that much harder on planet Earth. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, will it be, you know, an absolute disaster um, that depends in part on what we do, you know, for the next 50 years? And it depends in part on how we respond to the challenges that the world is going to face. And, you know, the record isn't great, let's be frank. Um, but... Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of, uh, one of the students in Eric's class this morning said, you know, we keep being told uh, in 10 years, if we don't do something in 10 years, you know, it's, it's catastrophe, it's over, and we keep passing 10 years, and here we all are. And I think, you know, that's basically true. We, we may still be here. We, there may still be 8, 9 billion people on the planet. You know, it's just a matter of the, of the conditions of life are going to be harder, I believe, and I believe that, uh, you know, ecological collapse in parts of the world is, is unfortunately um, quite possible. In um, advocating for a technological intervention uh, for climate change, are we just nursing the infrastructure of late stage capitalism, which itself produces accelerated climate change? Well, I mean, it, I guess it depends. You know, I, 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 I want to say genuinely, I, I am, you know, not advocating for technology. I'm not advocating against technology. You know, that's kind of not my role as a journalist, but I think once again, if we're going to be frank about it, and that's sort of what I was saying about solar panels and wind turbines, you know, those are technologies. How are we dealing with this besides uh, technological change? I don't see everyone, I don't see a world with 8 billion people who need to be fed for humanitarian reasons. I don't see that world going back to a... a um, you know, a world of of of, of horses and and, and 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 animal power and water power. I don't see that as practical. I'll be frank. I just don't see it. Uh, because things are only going to get worse. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about cultivating resilience, and especially in parts of the world that are more adversely affected by climate change? Well, I think that's a really, um, you know, super important point and question, and the question of even how you cultivate it is a really, you know, that is a really 
interesting and important question. I think that one point, once again, and you know, I'm a, I'm like a journalist. I, 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 you know, I sometimes play at being an expert in all these things. I am not. I am repeating to you, you know, what other experts have told me. I mean, one of the interesting things I think about parts of the world that are going to be hit hardest or first is they ha have always been dealing. You know, people who are living very close to the edge have always been resilient. You know, the, in in fact, you know, what's very very brittle arguably are our own systems that are, you know, so um, highly dependent on systems working, right? Um, but I think, so I think on some level, I mean, maybe you could call this good news. I, I don't really know. On some level, I think that people are, societies are more resilient where people have been living pretty close to the edge already. Um, but how you make it possible, you know, one of the big questions, I think one of the huge questions of our time, and we're seeing this playing out already for a variety of reasons, climate change just being one, is, you know, a lot, a lot of people on the move, right? Millions of people are gonna be on the move, and how are we going to deal with that? You know, is that resilience? Is that, is that you know, sheer power politics? What is it? But how is the, is the world gonna deal with that? And I don't, think there's an answer, you know, every country, presumably with a border, is going to be dealing with it on its own, but um, that is, gets back to this question of, you know, what is the what are the next 50 years going to look like? Are they going to be filled with terrible conflict over, you know, refugees and immigration, or are we going to work our way to some way of um, dealing in a humane way with you know the problems that we we and particularly we in the U.S. have created, and I don't know the answer to that, but obviously assisting, and this is the whole loss and damages issue, and and all sorts of other issues, assisting countries that are on, really really on the front lines, you would think that would be uh, in our interest for all sorts of reasons. Hi, I'm, I'm all the way in the back. Um, Eric, since you were talking about your dad, I'll talk about my dad. Uh, and my dad is also a conservative. Um, and he recently called me like about five days ago, like in a total panic. Um, and he was saying, and he, he, he knows I'm progressive, and he tried to couch it all in you know, language that I could, I could digest. And he basically said to me, Karen, um, uh, I understand that climate change is a problem. So this is my dad now, a conservative. Um, He's a fisherman. He sees what's happening in the waters. Uh, I understand that climate change is a problem, but he's like, de-dollarization is also a problem, and Russia's not going to stop uh, selling their gas. Um, and we are sitting on natural reserves that are cleaner than uh, Russian uh, gas. Uh, and the, 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 the divest, de, whatever the term is, the economic term, disinvestment, divestment in, uh, you know, uh, of um, you know, in in, in American um, fossil fuel production and in the you know is going to make the dollar go down. I'm not. I'm a French professor, by the way, so I'm summarizing this poorly. But you know, <laughs> anyway, he was trying to scare me by basically saying that the economy is going to collapse. This is not the time uh, to stop um, you know uh, drilling for for natural gas. Um, and uh, you know, I do understand that there's a climate problem. I was just wondering what you might res what you might respond to that because I think that like he's trying to meet me in the middle. Um, I wonder how much sometimes like I try to meet him in the middle with his economic concerns and his big concern. He's got four daughters that are middle class daughters, you know, and 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 we're talking about recession recessions. Uh, this could happen quickly. He thinks he said to me, "Get your get your assets and leave the country." Is what he said to me. <laughs> Where are you going to go? I do have multiple citizenships, so I can choose. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I guess unless you're going to Russia, though, no, no. Um, I, you know, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. I mean, I, I don't see any danger of our, you know, not um, exploiting our, unfortunately, our, our, our fossil fuel resources. We're, we're doing a pretty good job of doing that. And, uh, you know, we have become, once again, one of the, you know, world's major oil producers after not being so after. So we are, you know, we're, we're, we're just exploiting away. Um, so, you know, the idea that we're suddenly going to stop pumping oil or, or fracking gas, um, your dad doesn't have to worry, you know. Um, 
Now, if you if you say, well, what about all this? You know, what what about you know what environmentalists say? Keep it in the ground. You know, yeah, that's what you have to do. You can't do both. You can't fight climate change and keep pumping. You know, all the available. You know, we've. Um, looked at, uh, you know, people have looked at how much fossil fuel reserves there are out there, and, you know, there's enough to cook the planet, you know, many times over. Um, so we have to stop doing that at a certain point, right? Probably tomorrow or yesterday would have been a good time to do it. Um, and then the question becomes, you know, what are you going to do instead? And, and we keep putting off that reckoning, that reckoning is coming. There's no way, you know, we used to think it was going to come potentially through, you know, peak oil. That, you know, you could argue tragically is not going to happen. We're going to always find new ways. Our technologies are so good, we're always going to find ways to get more oil out of the ground uh, and more natural gas until, you know, we have completely fried the planet. Um, so we just have to make that transition, and the faster we make it, the better off we are. You know, and I, I just don't see any way around that. And I'm not particularly worried um, about economic collapse. I'm much more worried about ecological collapse. And the two could happen simultaneously. You can tell your dad that. First of all, thanks for being here. Second of all, I'll leave my dad out of it. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> I have a question about terminology. So today we've used climate change. There's an alternative, climate disruption. Why, it, and you have a unique perspective on this, why has that not achieved traction? It seems to be yeah. much more useful from a standpoint of maybe we'll change our thinking. Thanks. Um, that's an interesting question. And, you know, one, one other thing I, I want to just go back to the previous question for one second. I, I also do want to say that I, I think one of the questions, the profound questions, and one of the questions sort of alluded to that is whether, you know, we can preserve our American way of life in the face of all that's going on. Is If that's our priority, you know, then I think we are going to be in big trouble. Okay, now back to... Um, terminology, you know, when I started, you know, in the biz, I guess, you know, global warming, it was global warming, and people decided, um, you know, there's a tortured history on this, and I'm going to confess I don't really know, you know, the politics of it, um, but I think that some people thought that it's, it, everyone liked it, it's going to get warmer, oh, it's like, you know, going to go to Florida, you know, and, uh, uh, and then it became climate change, and that some people argue that was a right-wing conspiracy. Some people argue it was a left-wing conspiracy. I don't really know. It became climate change. And the, you know, that is, is sort of, more, you know, very anodyne and, and also, but it does cover the possibility that you could have a very cold winter, you know, and you'd still, the climate is still changing. Um, now, climate disruption, um, I don't know why that hasn't caught on. I'll, I'll be frank. I don't really know. Um, it's 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 a useful term, um, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll try it out. <laughs> Hi, um, my question. I'm right here. <laughs> is about emotions. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of emotions tied up in the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. And one of the things that really impressed me about your book is you have talked to so many people in so many places doing different types of actions related to these threats. And I'm just wondering if you have drawn any conclusions about the relationship between emotions or attitudes and the people who are taking action or taking certain kinds of action. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I do, I do think that most of the people that I have interviewed, um, you know, have shared, you know, across a lot of different fields, they have shared a kind of a can-do attitude, even if that, um, you know, means some, you know, ideas that might seem, you know, kind of wacky or whatever, um, or, or hopeless, honestly, you know, I mean, people who, you know, are trying to bring back, you know, a species that's down to two individuals, right? That's a really tough uh, order. But, um, you know, I think all of them share a sense of, of purpose, which, you know, 
should animate us all uh, in a moment of crisis. And so, you know, when you know, people often ask me, you know, how do you, how do you deal with all this? And I, I don't want to claim to be, you know, a paragon of, of mental health or anything. Um, and I am very, you know, honestly very discouraged by what is going on in the world. Um, but I think there is a sense of, you know, well, we've got to do something. Let's keep moving forward. You know, what is, what is the alternative? Um, and but I also do empathize, you know, we were talking about this before, I do empathize a lot with young, young people. I have, you know, kids who are inheriting this problem, obviously, um, and I think that that sense that inexorably, this is an inexorable process, and inexorably things are going to get more difficult uh, and worse if you consider global warming worse, which I think it's hard not to at this point, um, is very debilitating. That is not changing. That's not stopping, you know, unless uh, we decide to, you know, s shoot a lot of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. And even then, I'm not convinced that it's not. So it's not stopping. And that sense that, like, oh my God, this, this, this freight train, this tanker is moving forward no matter what we do, um, we can only make it better and worse. You know, slightly, you know, we can make it less bad or more bad. That's not a great situation. It's not a great message. It's not, it's not, not how you rally the troops, but it's unfortunately you know, the truth, and so we have to make it you know, less bad. We'll make this our last question. Hello. Um, I'm in a history class right now called Indigeneity and the Crisis of the Modern World. And something that we've sort of concluded is that um, being a part of a settler colonial society is causing a lot of the crises, including climate change. So I guess as a journalist, um, have you noticed the role of indigenous people when it comes to you know, environmental change? Are they a part of the conversation? And could they be more a part of the conversation? Um, that's, you know, that's a huge question, and I certainly don't want to, once again, claim to be, you know, expert, um, in that, um, you know, there was just a study, uh, that I was reading, you know, that when indigenous people in the Amazon were given control over the land, um, you know, the land fared better. I certainly, certainly believe, um, that many, in many parts of the world, indigenous people have had, you know, traditionally a different relationship uh, to the world and to the natural world that, you know, we would all benefit from, absolutely. Um, I think the problem here does get back to, there are eight billion of us, and we are not living, we, in this room, we are not living the way indigenous people uh, are generally living, and to be perfectly frank, many indigenous people don't want to be living the way they are now living. So we are faced with this, you know, clash of, you know, can modernity, <laughs> you know, be what we consider to be the good aspects of modernity, be equitably shared um, on a planet that's in a lot of trouble? And I do not have, I'm not in touch with enough, you know, indigenous groups to tell you, you know, what the way forward that they would see is. But I also see perils, I'm going to be frank, in our uh, attributing to them certain um, desires or ways of, of, of thinking that they may not, they may not even ascribe, uh, subscribe to. So I think uh, many indigenous groups would like to be living you know, bet, better, what we would consider better, a higher standard of living. So it's a very, very complicated issue. Well, I'd like to thank Elizabeth Colbert and Eric Loomis for giving us a lot to think about. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and being part of this important conversation. Our speaker will be available to sign books at the back of the room. So please stay if you can. And thank you again for coming. Thank you.